Right guys, welcome back to a vid. Another vid, I was going to say, but wouldn't be really another vid since I haven't been making vids. So here is a vid uh, to Dean from Escape to Gaming, who made a brilliant video called uh, My Greatest Gaming Memories. So just a compendium of all his favourite moments from gaming. And uh, I thought I'd like to do a response on that. And uh, yeah, so really good excuse to throw together loads of like small gaming anecdotes that might not have otherwise warranted mentioning but are fairly interesting or just stuff to talk about with games and why are we all here after all so yeah um, I'm gonna try and go in sort of chronological order but it, uh, it probably won't always be uh, we've got the uh, Shenmue movie playing here in honor of my uh, channel name and uh, one of my favorite games ever probably my favorite game ever although not favorite series my favorite series is Zelda just because there's more of them, but yeah. Shenmue the movie there. And that's certainly one of my greatest gaming memories. Uh, I played that on Dreamcast uh, with with copied discs, I, uh, I'm ashamed to admit. But it was at university and times were hard. And uh, this is my girlfriend telling me how long she will be. I have 40 minutes to make this video. Um, yeah, so Shenmue was brilliant. Played it on copied discs on a Dreamcast. At university, and it was great there, we had, uh, we knew a guy round the corner, everyone knew a guy when it came to Dreamcast because it was, uh, it was, it was so easy to copy those discs on Dreamcast. Everybody knew somebody who could do that, or they could do it themselves. We never bothered learning because we knew a guy round the corner who copied Dreamcast discs and we had just dozens and dozens of games for a very, very cheap price, brilliant, good times. Came at right, just the right time the Dreamcast did for us, uh, you know, students on a budget. But anyway, so being at university, I was really, really busy with all my studies. But in between those studies, I had some small amounts of time to immerse myself in this game, in this type of game. Uh, it was quite a innovative, obviously new, new style of game. I think it was the first open world 3D game of any note. Uh, it came out before Grand Theft Auto 3. Uh, so just that experience of exploring this world in this brand new way and in such a, well, a highly accomplished way as well. To say it was, if possibly the first example of that type of uh, 3D open world exploration, it was so robust, and it did things that were even more advanced than games nowadays are doing. You know, it had a, a very accomplished time cycle with events happening uh, at specific times, and this this grounded you in the kind of uh, reality of the world. You know, it really did a good job of creating this kind of living breathing world in a sense you were it was easily to easy to immerse yourself into Shemu and that's one of the main reasons it sticks out as a memory uh, yeah good times university right so but going back to the kind of start of gaming for me uh, the first time I uh, neglected my studies uh, in favor of playing a game was Repton on the Acorn Electric at school, yeah, that was the go-to game if you wanted to skive any work that you were supposed to be doing. Stick Repton on until the teacher caught you. Brilliant, good times. Around about the same time at home I had a Spectrum and I was playing Whizball. Uh, that was my favourite game on Spectrum. Uh, really bizarre, cool little game where you bounce around and you gain power-ups and add extra abilities to your little ball and navigate these worlds. It was balls hard, it was nails. I recently tried to play that game again on emulation and I sucked at it, but Whizball is ace. So moving on, uh, Star Wars, arcade, Atari, Atari Star Wars will be the one arcade game that I talk about in this video because that's really a whole other topic is arcade memories. Maybe, probably, this video would just be three hours long if I was comprehensive about best gaming memories, but um, Star Wars arcade was just insane. Again, a game that really immersed you especially in the sit-down cab because you had that really quite loud and uh, all pervasive you know sound with those beautiful Star Wars sound effects that to this day I you know argue that any mediocre game not saying that Atari Star Wars was but any mediocre game can be made two stars better or 20 percent better whatever your rating is by just the sound Star Wars sound effects alone so you if you apply Star Wars sound effects to a mediocre game it instantly just becomes better to this brain anyway. But yeah, Star Wars Arcade, just to get off point there, was an amazing game. Uh, 
you have to play it with those original controllers that bespoke uh, I've forgotten what they call it now there's a name for it the, the very uh, unique controller that you have for Star Wars it just doesn't seem to work on any other method of controller that I have used anyway. I know Steve Benway has tried many many more versions of this game than I and I do recall watching a video of Steve's where he uh, commented on what he thought was the best control method in the home for that. Uh, I can't remember which one it was that he said was best now but um, yeah so but arcades is a whole different video I think so although although there is one arcade experience that I've got to talk about and uh, it's from when I was quite young I don't know how old I'm going to say around 10 or 11 ish but uh, maybe around there anyway um, I used to go on holiday with my grandparents to caravan parks in Wales and one in particular called Glanguna and it was this really idyll idyllic gorgeous little caravan park in like a a valley it was in a valley so it was in north of Wales and um, they had a little arcade there and uh, me and my sister used to go in there of an evening and uh, they had a cab of Street Fighter 1 the original Street Fighter and uh, one of my greatest gaming memories is playing that game for the first time and amassing a kind of crowd around me as they watch me get all the way to Sagat, the final boss, only to be beaten by Sagat, the final boss. It was a bittersweet moment and yet still garnered the respect of my admirers in the arcade, uh, ten year old, something like that, yeah. I don't know if the cab was set too easy or something, but I just breezed through to Sagat without losing a life, yeah. So. That was a weird, uh, a weird little arcade in Glanguna, uh, caravan park. It was it, not 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 much supervision, shall we say. There was at one point I do remember that uh, there was no attendant there, and somebody I don't know if it was me, honestly. Somebody tried the lid on the coin drop machine, and it was actually open. So you had a bunch of kids just scooping all of the coins out of the two p coin dropper machine like this, and yeah, took all the fun out of it, but got some more games on Street Fighter out of it, so that was sweet. Moving swiftly on, Sonic the Hedgehog 1 on Mega Drive. Walking into a chips store in Middlesbrough to see this game playing on a cab and a bunch of kids crowded around this cab and I couldn't see what the game was when I first moved, walked into this store. I just saw this group of kids watching something on a cab and as I got in there I could see these beautiful bright colours, this fast moving graphics it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before it was Sonic the Hedgehog but this, you have to understand kids, gamers today you don't know you're born right, back in the day you didn't get you couldn't just look up any game that you heard of and see what it ran like as soon as you heard about it no, your only visual uh, you know, uh, stimulus. You, the only visual you had on games that were had been talked about or, you know, pre-release or that had just come out was screenshots in magazines. So you saw these screenshots and you thought, ah, oh, that looks nice. Uh, you didn't see it moving. This was a moment that will never be replicated again. Walking into a store and seeing this game running and just, yeah, uh, being really impressed by the speed and fluidity of Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, and I think that was before it came out in this country. I, th I believe that the releases were staggered and it came out first in uh, in Japan. And I never I, d I never had the uh, English uh, version of Sonic 1, so I have got Sonic 2 here as a visual aid, which I forgot to hold up. Um, yeah, because I never had the English one and I still don't want to own it. I just think it looks horrible, that English case, and I still haven't got round to picking up a Japanese uh, Sonic 1, which is what I had back in the day. Um, but everyone loves Sonic and did, especially back in day, was good. More Mega Drive memories, let's just crack on with them. Echo the Dolphin, just so unique and immersive. Immersion is a key word in most of the kind of standout gaming memories that I have, and this is something I share with probably all gamers. It's probably a pointless distinction to make, but specifically, I'm thinking of Dean. Dean talks about the immersion factor of gaming and. Uh, Echo the Dolphin was certainly one of the first games that gave me that real immersion feel to a game. Just the atmosphere, you know, the sound, everything about it just uh, dragged, drug, 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 dragged, dragged you under the waves 
under the surface and you sank into this game quite literally but also metaphorically metaphysically words yeah uh, another game with the immersion factor turned up to 11 but for completely different reasons on the Mega Drive was Flashback holy shit cyberpunk perfection you know again uh, the aesthetics of it were just something to behold at the time that fluid graphics of course but also the you know the storyline uh, you know that, that Blade Runner feel to it this uh, futuristic detective uh, doing really interesting and varied things as mission statements and I just was pulled into this game Summit Chronic flashback is a big game in memory but back in the um, more Mega Drive stuff Shinobi again with the immersion the sound the visuals created a feeling that just felt I don't know more mature it was it was more mature Shinobi uh, Revenge of Shinobi rather was a beautiful game and uh yeah, the music, man. Some of the music. Holy, it's no surprise that those a lot of games are getting kind of these uh, vinyl releases now. The soundtracks, because there was some really nice uh, music on those uh, on that 16-bit gen. All right, so just to hold up because there's so many memories. This is the first FIFA, uh, but really I was kind of a pro Evo man back in the day as a kid, and then into university later on. I was kind of I preferred pro Evo the whole time, really, but. Many, many good memories of football. You know, any get any bunch of lads together, remotely interested in gaming, and football games will eventually happen. Most of my best friends over the years, we've enjoyed playing uh, FIFA. In fact, I need it on their CV. If you want to be my best friend, you need to be able to play a football video game because it is a lot of fun. And um, anybody who's played them doesn't need explaining why it's fun, but if you haven't for some reason, it's the fluidity of the movement, it's the open ended gameplay uh, of soccer games soccer of uh, football games uh, yeah you know the movement the passing it's it's all quite you can link it to sacred geometry you know with your triangles and your circles and your, your la it's just you know it feels very uh, open ended the gameplay basically very very creative very uh, allows you to be very play creatively and uh, that's a good thing in gaming yeah so Anyway, more Mega Drive memories. I've talked about this game a lot already. Sword of Million, the first RPG that I ever got into. Designed by Yu Suzuki, who also made Shenmue. This was his first console exclusive. I did a whole video about this, so I won't go on about it again, really, but you can watch that. The link will be in the low bar if you're interested. Sword of Million, cracking RPG. Um, Street Rage 2, again with the music, again with the immersion, pulling you into this world, and really, you really felt like you were there, kind of thing. Uh, who needs VR? Who needs 110 degrees? No, you could get pulled into the screen on fucking 4x3 quite easily. It just takes a bit of an imagination. Yeah. See, for people, when people who, from the book age, because we no, no longer have a book, so they're gone completely now, people from the book age used to complain that, oh, these video game kids, they don't have no imagination, it's just all in a plate. Wrong. Wrong. Anyway, last one for Mega Drive, I think, is uh, Super Street Fighter 2. Um, I didn't get the Japanese version, though, back in the day, the PAL release. Uh, but the, uh, the kind of the standout memory I have with that game in particular is, uh, it's, I think it's one of the first games that I kind of went to get on the day of release. And I knew when it was coming out, and I went downtown ready for it, and uh, bought it dead excited, and just, uh, clutching it in my hands as I walked through town. And uh, went and sat on my uncle's front doorstep for a couple of hours because he wasn't back from work yet, and stayed there till he did get back from work. At which point, mum and dad came and picked me up. I believe something like that occurred anyway. I just remember being sat on a step for ages with this, looking through the manual and being very, very excited. Not this manual, but just very excited to have it. And uh, yeah, even having Street Fighter Championship Edition and then this again, you know, uh, on the Mega Drive in the first place was something we never expected to have. We were always jealous of those SNES bastards who had Street Fighter and we didn't think we were going to get it. And, uh, yeah, We're all familiar with that memory, those from that era. Anyway, so moving on. After 16-bit generation, uh, my console next after that was really N64, I guess, at the time. That's, that's the one I played on, mo that I owned and played on the most of uh, after that one. And so, yeah, some standouts from that are obviously 
Super Mario 64, uh, you know, GoldenEye and uh, Ocarina of Time. GoldenEye, I can't play it now, I can't go back to it and use that those yellow buttons for the camera. It's, it bamboozles, bamboozles my brain, I can't relearn how to use an N64 controller for 3D movement. It'll have to happen at some point though, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about everyone knows how amazing those games are, but some of my standout memories are just that. that in, If we're talking chronologically, those were some standout titles from that little period, but yeah. Um, I should go back actually, yeah, I should go back because I've got another standout memory with video games. Now, I got this to illustrate uh, the point. Obviously, this is a modern kind of phone, uh, mobile VR headset, but. Um, one of my standout gaming memories is is, uh, is playing the original VR machines, the really big ones with the circle around it and the huge headsets that I don't remember being, you know, um, too heavy. I don't think it was restrictively heavy, uh, but it was huge, yeah. And obviously really simple polygon graphics, but this is like 20 years ago, so it, it was enough. It was enough for you to go, oh, that was a thing. I just I did that. That was definitely a thing that I just did, and I just remember it was some type of mech battle game, and you just have to look around and search for your opponent. And it was quite disorientating. I'll say the frames per second weren't that high. Polygon count was very low. Don't remember a screen door effect, but I was about 11, 12, 13, something like that. But I played that when I'd gone down to London for an audition for a film, The Secret Garden made by Warner Brothers. Uh, for some reason my headmaster, who was also my drama teacher, put me forward for this audition. I did alright at it. Got shortlisted. Went down to London for a final audition, I believe, for the main part of Dickon. And fucked it up. Instead of spending the day learning my lines, I saw some VR machines in Covent Garden and went and played on them. And didn't really spend a lot of time learning my lines. Uh, so it's all just a dos about an excuse to go down London really at the time, I wasn't that bothered about it. But yeah, I believe the lad who went on to get the part in as Dickin in the Secret Garden uh, ended up doing the doing did Black Beauty as well. Made lots of money. But I think by then I was 13, I was already starting to look a bit older. I think I had a little bit of acne. I didn't quite have the round faced country bumpkin look that they were looking for. <sighs> How life could have been different. Yes. I should have mentioned actually, Shenmue, the movie, playing on TV, donated to me by Shox16. Really happy to be having this CRT TV to properly experience the old older games now. I'm getting right back into them. Good shit. Right, what should I do next? Well, talking about Shox, you've got to talk about the Saturn. And I've put down in a pile beneath my feet here, Virtua Fighter 2. Uh, I was really jealous of the uh, Saturn owners. I didn't have one myself back in the day. It took me a long time to get one. Uh, but I you know, I played this and obviously played it in the arcade and then seen it running uh, on the Saturn and just couldn't believe how good it looked. It was so um, smooth and uh, you know fluid. Those two the same thing? I don't know, it looked good. But it just it rep represents a little time there for gaming that was really exciting because you had the three main consoles at the time was obviously the Saturn, the PlayStation 1 and the N64 and all three of those platforms had amazing exclusives um, so yeah all three of them had a real strong lineup to give you a reason to go for those platforms and but I, I, didn't, I, I didn't get the Saturn at the time but I was, yeah I really fucking love Virtual Fighter 2 just for the extra depth of it uh, you know the blocking is more evolved at the counters and and that was something that really appealed because I liked the idea of these fighting games but a lot of them were a bit too simple this one was a bit more complex and involving immersive again DC see well, good times yeah right I'm moving swiftly on to I think the original Xbox no wait if we're going chron chronologically I've got to do these first so Mega Drive and Mega CD were my uh, consoles with a 16 bit gen um, got the Mega CD after having been burgled. We went out for dinner at this restaurant that ended up being shut, so we weren't out of the house more than an hour and 20 minutes, if that. Because we just got there, realised it was shut, oh fuck, came back. We was out of the house about an hour and 20 minutes ish. 
And in that time we got burgled. Someone had crowbarred the back kitchen window and uh, the house was a bit of a mess. Uh, but, you know, we uh, I, did, I did the right out of it, I have to say, out of the insurance. Um, managed to kind of uh, claim for a lot of uh, games that I definitely still had and hadn't, you know, sold or traded away since. Um, and ended up getting a mega CD with that uh, insurance money, so... And they were really expensive at the time. I got this thing pretty close to launch. So you're talking mega CD for about, is it 350 quid? Back in the day as well. 94, 95, something. 94, wasn't it? Yeah. But I had a hell of a lot of fun with that system for admittedly a short amount of time. But I don't know how long it was, six months a year, probably six months, I don't know. I had an amazing time with the Mega CD. And some of my strongest gaming memories come from that system. Even though it didn't have a, you know, a very strong lineup overall, in terms of you know numbers, it has some standout experiences for me. And uh, most of you will probably know already, Two of those are Night Trap and Double Switch, the FMV uh, kind of games where, if you don't know already, bitch, where you been? You have control of a CCTV system around a house in which young girls in underwear are in peril and being chased by scary men that come in through windows. And your job is to keep an eye on these people and trap the scary people at the right time. It's basically a quick time event. It's basically... Is it a quick time event? What is it? I don't know. It's very simplistic gameplay and yet very immersive and very involving. Uh, because to play it properly, what you really had to do, and it's something I just wouldn't have the time or inclination to put as much effort into do today, but back in the day, I did. I made a list, a chronological list of everywhere you needed to be, and that is just through raw trial and error of which rooms you need to be in to catch the criminals and to catch the right pieces of storyline and basically play a perfect game as close as possible to a perfect game. That was a laborious process but I did it and enjoyed every minute of it and uh, yeah the, that digital pictures um, intro uh, you know uh, icon noise logo whatever gif is still one of the strongest you know gaming kind of mem uh, feels that I have is just hearing that and then yeah there was double switch which kind of advanced the formula a bit you had a map to the side where you could see where the enemies were in each room so it wasn't quite as blind you could uh, you know do it a little bit easier there's a bit more forgiving but superb like cheese I just love this B movie cheese feel to it again high you know big feels for, for double switch so yeah that's Mega CD the main ones from it anyway. Um, around about the same era, no, a bit later, we're talking about I'm all over the place now. Wipeout and PS1, um, again with the immersion, again, it's half down to the aesthetics. You know, it had that uh, really futuristic kind of feel to it. Very, again, very kind of Blade Runner ish. I don't know, that's an overused term, probably is in my mind, but it's all linked together in one glorious futuristic dystopia with cool symbols. So there's that. Um, but yeah, the physics of it really uh, felt, made you feel connected to the tracks as well. It can piss you off when you crash, but made it all the more satisfying when you got a clean run through a level. It did feel like you were floating because it was that difficult to keep a clean run without any little uh, nicks and dints, uh, you know, to this smooth line. And the music, of course, the flow, the flow of the music and the tracks and everything. It's perfectly constructed, uh, perfectly constructed racing game. Yeah, unforgiving the first one, uh, but you know, master it and you get a lot out of it. Um, for the same reason, I enjoyed this game, Amped, and Amped Two on Xbox. Uh, yeah, some of my best kind of chilled gaming memories are, are these games, um, and Wipeout as well. It's but especially Amped, more chilled, less stressful. Wipeout is only chilled when you're a fucking ninja at it. Until that point, it's stressful. Amps is chilled from start to finish. Uh, and this is how I used to play it. Because you could choose your own music to play on the original Xbox. That was innovative. Um, so I used to put on like really chilled music and play this. And it fit really well, I thought. Um, yeah. Nice. Good times. Right. 
the Tony Ox Pro Skater 2. This is 2X on the original Xbox, it's an NTSC exclusive. Uh, this isn't the game, the version I played back in the day, I played it on PlayStation 1, I do believe. Um, but Tony Ox 2 is an interesting little story. Um, there was a demo of it somewhere, I think it was on a disc on a magazine. There was, there was a demo of Tony Ox 2. And uh, you had to enter it in, in, on a, in the park level, some certain level, skate park level. And uh, you had to get as many points as you could. It was to see who could get the highest points on this one level, two minutes uh, run on, on Tony Ox 2. And uh, I think the eventual winner got something like 5 million. I got 1.5 million and I thought that was pretty sweet. I was quite happy with that. And uh, I actually got a letter back from them saying that we were sending back a congratulations to anybody who got over a million points because that is a pretty good achievement for that game. Uh, but yeah, the winner, I think, either 3.5 or 5 million, something like that, a, lot, a long way off. But one of the very, very few gaming competitions that I've entered. The only other, actually, gaming competition that I've entered that I can remember, I won. I say I won, I really mean my mother won, because it was a Rice Krispies Name That Sonic game competition. And uh, I'm sure my mum came up with the title of the game. I can't remember what that title is, and neither can she. I've already asked her that question. But we ended up winning a Sega Master System 2. And with Alex the Kid installed and something else. So yeah, off the back of Rice Krispies, wrote in to name a Sonic game and, and won a Master System 2. That was pretty sweet. So, 50% of the competitions I've ever entered for games, I've won. That's pretty good. Yeah, uh, right, let's stick with the original Xbox then, I guess. Uh, oh, well, I can't, you know, do this vid without mentioning Halo. Um, hadn't been a huge fan of first person shooters before then. Uh, yeah, I, I think more recently I've come, become conscious of the fact that I prefer kind of uh, fantastical settings for shooters. I, don't, I think I've come to realise that it kind of puts me off all this gritty murdering of humans business. Uh, for you know, questionable ethical uh, you know narratives and stuff. Not that I, no, I don't know. It's not like something I sit there and go, oh, this is really shit. I can't. No, it's, it's more subconscious. It nigs away, and I've just realised recently. I think that I do prefer a more fantastical setting. Uh, and I don't know, but anyway, la la la. Halo was certainly the first FPS that I got into in a big way. I do believe, yeah. Of course, there was fantastical FPSs before that. If you can go f as far back as Doom and stuff, but I didn't really play Doom or any of those games. Uh, but yeah, everyone knows about Halo. I'm not going to talk about too much about that. But another game on the original Xbox that get, had a similar impression. Uh, this again was you know a first-person game that just raised the bar. I mean, I thought Halo was as far as it went. Then Half-Life 2 came. Yeah, and I know it had already been out on PC, but I was never a PC gamer, so. Consoles are my only frame of reference. So when Half-Life 2 dropped, holy shit, game changer. Just the fidelity of the experience, the attention to detail of the storylines and the environments. Uh, you know, the abilities were cool as well. Lots of innovation, Half-Life 2. Big feels for that. Um, more original Xbox games. For similar reasons, Splinter Cell, again, felt like it kind of pushed the envelope. Uh, had a higher fidelity of game experience and just the you know the subtlety with the, of the gameplay you had to stop and think your way around situations more than other games that I can remember um, from that era so yeah I felt like it really introduced a lot of, uh, of depth to that type of game and stealth the stealth genre you know obviously been massively influenced by the Splinter Cell series and uh, there's still a couple of them I haven't played yet but I've I've got them all I've played most of them I think there's one and a half that I still need to play. Yeah. Uh, original Xbox, also Silent Hill 2, just representing the whole Silent Hill 2, Silent Hill 2 series, um, the early ones at least, um, just because they shit me up. That is some, that is some, you know, powerful gaming memories. Just the fact that a game can uh, affect you that uh, that's that much, that vividly. Um, yeah, to be really scared by a game. It, you know, you've got to play it with the lights off, of course, everyone knows, preferably after a something. Uh, there's a cat behind me, I just felt a weird presence.
he's never played Silent Hill 2. Although he can be quite scary, sometimes he is a shadow cat. He will hide in the darkness and ask him to be tripped over. Because of course, as you can see, the top half of him is black. So if you just see the top half, he's a hazard in the dark. Most chilled out cat ever. Does not give a single solitary shit. You wish you gave less shit, as, as few shits as Nitro. Anyway, so, Silent Hill 2, and yeah, gaming memories that stand out are, the, some of them are the, the scary games, the ones that have really elicited that kind of emotional response to you, and a more recent one that did that, that I picked out somewhere, that will show up for the benefit of eyes, that I can now not see. Oh yeah, is uh, Condemned on the 360. Uh, fucking hell. Yeah, genuinely shit me up. You know, you've got like, um, it's the noises that they make before you see them. You'll hear some, you know, deranged scrabbling and shrieking around some corner. And as I believe it's directional as well, I've never played it on 360 sound system, that'd be awesome. Might well do that. But anyway, yeah, it's really, really immersive. Again, there's that word, Dean, it's true. It is a vital component of the best gaming experiences. Um, but yeah, you hear those deranged noises and then they, and they lumber towards you and just the, the almost freeform nature of how they kind of move towards you and around uh, makes it feel really genuine. Uh, yeah, it did a good job of, of scaring. It's a good, awesome game. Another more recent game, Portal 2. Uh, one of the best kind of online multiplayer games uh, experiences that I've had. Uh, you know, just something different, of course, uh, something a bit more cerebral. And it's nice to work on, you know, to, I, I like games that make you think, you know, solutions to problems rather than, you know, you know it's, it's a nice change of pace. Um, and yeah, this is definitely one of the best online experiences I've had. Um, I believe I played it with Carla, my partner, uh, when we, before we kind of, well, as we were getting together. Anyway, yeah. Oh, well, I should, if I'm going to talk about those types of games, I have to mention uh, Brothers, uh, which is quite a recent memory from a couple of years ago, but it's the best, like, uh, um, partner gaming experience I've had, I guess. Uh, because Brother, if you don't know, Brothers is a, a, a game you can only get online uh, on the consoles, and uh, you basically control two characters, one with each uh, thumbstick. But we had this idea of sitting together, controlling one thumbstick each, one brother each, and playing together through this game. You're supposed to control it yourself, but we was like hugging, snuggling, and we had one side of the controller each, like this, and played it like that. And it was a really cool way to play that game, and that was a cool game in memory. Um, yeah, we also played Halo together. We completed Halo 3, I think it was. Or was it 4? It might have been 4. We, yeah, we completed Halo 4 together online on Legendary. As we began our courtship. How cool is that? Yeah, she's a keeper. But uh, that is Halo 4. And another good memory for that is uh, going to the midnight launch. It's the only time I've ever done a midnight launch. And uh, I went for that. And bizarrely, it's one of my most viewed videos. I don't think it consists of that much. Uh, but yeah. Um, I wasn't. I can't say I was disappointed by it. I really did enjoy it. You know, they'd raised the bar so many times and so high that. I don't know. Wasn't it that much further for it to go, at least on this generation? I'm definitely not happy with Halo 5. Uh, even though I've not played it much. Uh, yeah, the whole campaign with it being kind of squad based does not sit well in my craw. But uh, there it is. I'm going to hold up Rock Band as an example, but the memory is really Guitar Hero 1 and 2. And uh, at the time I was living with uh, a good friend that I used to work with. Um, his bachelor is in a bachelor pair. Don't know why I went American. Uh, and we played a lot of Guitar Hero 1 and 2. And we got pretty sweet at it. And yeah, we one year planned to have a stall at a local festival where we wanted to set up the Guitar Hero system, you know, with the obviously screen and the controller using a, using a portable generator. 
and we thought we'd make a lot of money, thought that'd be a really cool idea, could charge people to come and have a go on Guitar Hero at this local small rock festival. Uh, but we didn't do it in the end because we thought better of it. The logistics were scary. You know, if it rained, we'd be fucked. If people tried to nick the stuff, we'd be fucked. Many problems, we basically chickened out, we didn't do it. But I've really enjoyed the, uh, the, yeah, the rock band games and the Guitar Hero games. And a lot of you will know I used to make uh, rock band videos back when I could be asked to do editing. Uh, many, many years ago now. I uh, did a string of rock band videos and uh, edit, edited together me doing all the different parts of the song and putting it together and presenting these horror shows for the internet because I have no shame. Uh, is that it? Is that all the games I've amassed to talk about? It's not comprehensive but it is a video. There you go Dean. There are some of my greatest gaming memories. Goodbye.